This episode of How to Not Suck at Music is brought to you by Skillshare. What I'm trying to do here with the series is bridge the gap between private instruction and watching people tell you what to do on YouTube. I mean, that's exactly what I'm doing, but hopefully I'm giving a little bit more tailored feedback to specific people so that you can learn from what they're doing. So our first submission is from Michael Briggs, originally submitted for the Kiesel Guitar Solo Contest. So let's check that out. Okay, I'm gonna stop you right there. There's a couple things that I want to say about your playing. I, I really actually do like the phrasing that you're using here. Maybe it's a little, I don't know, Guthrie Govan-esque, but there are a couple critiques that I think might be useful for you and for people who are watching. Now, the first thing is your tone. The reason why jazz guitarists play really thick gauge strings is because their clean sound has a lot of sustain. There's a couple things that you can do to get that sort of sustain. You can play with a lot of compression or you could play with a little bit of overdrive or a little bit of grit to your sound. That saturation adds not only a little bit more sustain, but it also adds harmonic content. That upper harmonic content can make up for the fact that your fundamental tone is not quite as congealed, I guess, as if you were playing thicker gauge strings. Anyway, let's listen to the rest of your entry. Okay, I'm gonna stop you, this is great. You hit kind of like a wonky note, bent it up into a note that wasn't that weird sounding. And that's something that I got from Victor Wooten, the idea that you're never more than a half step away from a correct note. If you think that the seven notes of the major scale and whatever key that you're playing are the correct notes, you're never going to be more than a semitone away mathematically. Just shift whatever you're doing, either up a half step or down a half step. It applies on any instrument as long as you're playing in, you know, 12 tone equal temperament. You actually did that again. You hit a wonky note and bent it higher. And it reminds me of a phrase that I use a lot, which is repetition legitimizes. Repetition legitimizes. Repetition legitimizes. If you hit something wrong, it sounds like a mistake. But if you hit something wrong again, people are forced to contextualize it differently and start hearing the meaning in the wrongness. And you can really lean into this. It takes a great musical ear and great skill to really lean into the wrong notes and make it sound interesting. But it also is an extremely rewarding activity, and I recommend that you try doing that more and more often. You were able to expand your sonic palette a little bit beyond the sort of like minor pentatonic Dorian sort of vibe that you've been going for with this particular sort of solo. Playing the minor pentatonic scale and playing the Dorian scale over these sorts of guitar vamps sounds great, but the problem is, at least to my ear, it kind of gets, I don't know, a little bit boring after a while playing with the same sort of sonic palette. If you think about how the Dorian scale, or its relative major scale, has seven notes, there are five notes in the gamut and the chromatic scale that don't work. This five note pentatonic scale is something I call the anti-pentatonic scale. All the notes which don't work within a particular key. It can be fun to try and take those five notes and try and figure out ways of weaving them into a solo and trying to make them make sense. Because remember, re re repetition legitimizes. Anyway, thanks for your submission. Let's go on to the next one. Next one will be Pierce Green, a bass player. Let's check him out. So first of all, I do like the song choice a lot, Chance the Rapper's No Problem, mainly because I know Ivan and Connor of Brass Tracks. They're friends of mine from school. They're the production duo that did that song. Ivan's actually played my big band before. I've recorded at his studio before. You know, people say that the music world is small, and I guess that's true. I mean, I like to think of it as the people that I know from school went on to do really awesome things, and I'm really lucky to have worked with them. So yeah, 
Brass Tracks is awesome. The thing that I would suggest working on for you in particular is taking a look at your right hand because you're not alternating your right hand's fingers. For two finger bass technique, you have two options really. You have something called raking and you have something called strict alternation. And for you, I recommend strict alternation just because it's an easier way to contextualize within your practice routine. Strict alternation involves literally that. Whenever you play a note, say with your index finger, the next note has to be with your middle finger. And then after that, your index finger again. In the beginning, when you're practicing this, your fingers will not cooperate. Because you've been playing with whatever finger comes naturally, the muscle memory has not been built up yet. So the way that I want you to practice this is in front of a mirror, looking at your right hand. Ideally, also try and record this on your phone. Say index every time that you play with your index finger, and then say middle every time that you play with your middle finger. Saying index and middle can feel very awkward, but that's actually kind of the point because you can't actually play that quickly when you're having to say index, middle, and middle, 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 middle. It's gonna force you to really slow down and think about what you're doing so that you can develop the muscle memory necessary to have a really strong and independent technique from what your conscious brain is thinking of. That's the main thing in your technique. The other thing in your technique, watch out for the left hand wrist, and this is going to be a running theme in all of these. Make sure that your left hand wrist is straight, and I cannot emphasize that enough. Your left hand wrist really needs to be straight so that you don't end up hurting yourself in the long run. And the final thing, honestly, I think you should check out the bass line one more time because you're missing this slide from the E on the A string, the seventh fret on the A string, like this doo. I really like bass slides. Bass slides are this really fun, really musically effective tool that every bass player uh, eventually learns to love and abuse maybe a little bit. I definitely might slide a little bit too much for my own good, but check that out. I really think that you'll get a lot from that aspect of the bass line. So anyway, the next person is D Tuner. Uh, he sent in a video of him playing along with a porcupine tree song. Let's check that out. So not to hammer on the same point over and over and over again, but definitely check out your left hand wrist. Any sort of bend in the wrist, especially over long periods of practice, can increase the risk of repetitive stress injury. So make sure that you straighten that out. The best way of straightening it out is just taking your thumb and pointing it towards the headstock. It's a simple and easy way of making sure that you have the flexibility in your wrist to straighten it out. Now, another thing that I do wanna mention about your technique is something I would call a nervous tick almost, and that's your tendency to whenever you are playing an open string and not playing a fretted note, to let your left hand just sort of swing down. Now that in itself is kind of, quote, bad because it violates the principle of economy of motion. There's nothing to be actually be gained by swinging your hand down. Just keep your hand there at the ready to fret the next note. But zooming back a little bit and maybe taking a little bit more of a holistic view of the situation, you need to correct this because you're not really in control of your body. This is something that you might not even be aware of. Part of having a solid instrumental technique is body awareness, knowing what your body actually does in a given situation, and then trying to channel all of those energies into playing the instrument in the most efficient and safe way possible. The one final critique I would have is maybe your tone. You have a fretless electric bass and you have, I'm guessing, flat wounds on it, which is okay, but maybe not for this particular kind of music. Fretless bass sometimes has some problem with sustain when you have flat wound strings on them, so maybe consider switching to round wound strings. That might come down to maybe a little bit more of my own personal preference than anything that you're doing. This is, after all, Adam Neely's guide on how to not suck at music. So thank you for your submission. Mission, and I thought it would be a good time right now to take a brief moment to thank the sponsor of this video, Skillshare, which is an online learning community with over 15,000 classes on things like photography and design, and also music making and music theory and music production. Membership starts as low as $10 a month, and if you want to, you can download the mobile app either on Android or iPhone, where you can watch all of these courses offline if you want to. When Skillshare approached me for this video, I was really excited because it really fits in with the mission statement of this series, which is to bridge the gap between private instruction and online learning. I've been checking out a lot of the music production courses, especially ones by Jason Allen on Ableton Live, which is fantastic, and also the one on Logic Pro. I don't really use Logic Pro, but I've had to use it for a couple of projects recently, and the course has given me a great overview of the program. If you're at all interested in Skillshare, definitely check out this link right here. It will give you a two-month free trial for the first 200 people who sign up. So thank you very much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. I think it's a really awesome thing. And uh, yeah, let's check out the next victim. All right, so the next person is a guy by the name of Nick Kruger, he submitted something called I Can't Sleep. Let's check that out. All 
All right, before we continue listening to this, I want you to be thinking a little bit more about the control of your dissonance. Now, dissonance can be relative. Something that's dissonant in one context can be really consonant in another. For a simple pop song, like a major seventh chord might be kind of a weird dissonance against a melody, but in a jazz standard, a major seventh chord might be great. And in like a 12 tone, like serial composition, a major seventh chord might be almost two consonants. Whatever the context, you need to make sure that your dissonance is appropriate for that context. Right now, you have some spicy chords thrown in, but I don't really understand their context to the key or whether or not they're supposed to be that dissonant or, you know, you, you gotta be thinking about these things in relationship to what your general tonal aesthetic is. I'm gonna, just gonna kinda like mention that and let's, let's keep listening. <laughs> stop you again. Can you sing back, or better yet, even play back any of the stuff that you just wrote? And what I mean is, realistically, can you just sing the contour of the melody? Can you perform the contour of the melody? Has it been at all internalized in yourself to the point that you could conceivably actually do that? And chances are probably not. I got that question from Esperanza Spalding, and to me that question, can you sing what you just played, is very important because it means that you have to take responsibility for everything that you do, and you have to really have internalized everything that you do in order to realize it in a certain way. The machine is your tool, but it is not your music maker. And to me, it's fairly obvious when you're just inputting notes into the machine with no responsibility of what it is that you just wrote. Now let's continue listening a little bit further. There are a few more ideas that I have for you. Um, maybe they'll become a little bit more clear the more that we listen. first time that we've heard an actual melody here. Na, na, do, da. And I think that's very important that you have a recognizable melodic thing, some sort of rhythmic idea that the piece can congeal around. So if you're gonna rewrite this, focus in on that particular idea because that my ear immediately latched onto because you repeated it. Not to beat a dead horse, but repetition legitimizes. If you consider Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, bum 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 bum, bum 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 bum, literally the entire first movement is based upon that particular motif. That motivic development is what uh, W.A. Matthew in his book Bridge of Waves calls the most severe essay on rational beauty. You have something like John Coltrane's a love supreme, a love supreme, which is basically the whole idea from which all of the other crazy improvisations sort of spring from. The simpler and more concise an idea you have, the more that you can do with it. The broader compositional architecture you can develop and the more that your listener can go along with you on your journey. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that this is the case, but it almost feels like you added the production elements of the drums and all that other stuff to kind of prop up the harmony and melody because you weren't feeling like they could stand on their own. To me, the central idea of your piece is that na -da, do -da, melodic cell that you sort of develop a little bit. Maybe focus a little bit more on that. All right, guys, that's all the time that we have right now. I'm sorry if I didn't get to your selection. I mainly tried to select things that I feel like I could have meaningfully commented on. You know, a lot of submissions maybe were things that uh, were instruments that I didn't play or things that, I guess, people playing different styles that maybe I wouldn't be the best teacher for. So I mainly wanted to select things that I think my personal musical voice and my musical experience could actually lend some insight into. So if you want to submit something for the next episode in the series, definitely leave it in the comments below. I wanted to say thank you for all of my Patreon patrons because it's my Patreon patrons that actually make this channel what it is week after week. I'm very indebted to everybody over there. I also wanted to say thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. And until next time, everybody, Base.